Wi-Fi refers to wireless internet. Uh, companies like Time Warner will say they're going to give you free wireless. This is a marketing gimmick. It's also a giant pet peeve of mine. Wi-Fi in the home isn't an additional service provided by the company. It's a feature of the hardware provided by the company. So in order to get wireless internet in your home, like Wi-Fi, what that almost 100% of the time refers to as having a wireless access point. So you have a piece of hardware that provides a wireless signal that your computer can connect to. There's also wireless internet or WiMAX as it's often called. And this is something that uh, Google famously provided. I don't know if they still do. I'd have to verify that. They provided for a time in and around um, San Francisco, where anywhere in the in the region, you could connect to a wireless service provided by Google. And it was, it's essentially rather than having a cable coming into your house providing internet, it's a wireless signal. But that's not what these companies are offering, and uh, it just, it bugs me. Anyway, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi has many, many, many parts. You may have seen this 802.11a, b, g, n, well, what does that mean? basically refers to the frequency and the speed. The 802.11 is uh, the section from the IEEE that refers to the standard that governs how Wi-Fi is set up. That's a lot of information that's not really that important. Basically, well it is important, but it doesn't really matter in this class. Uh, the simplified version is it's talking about how the signal is sent and how the signal is used. Um, and there's a lot of physical or a lot of physics involved and signal attenuation and sort of, you know, it's using uh, 900 megahertz versus uh, 5 megahertz or 5 gigahertz uh, signal and how that propagates through materials and the, the amount of information that can be sent per second. It's a, it's a lot of stuff. Um, the thing to really keep in mind is as things advance, you start having sort of more channels accessible. So think of that like being able to watch multiple TV stations at once. And each of those stations is sort of able to send more information uh, per second. That's, that's really the difference. So DSL. Uh, some of you may remember DSL. You don't really hear about it that much anymore. Um, it's pretty much now you get either... Uh, cable internet or something like Verizon or um, Fios. This store stands for digital subscriber line. It used to be digital subscriber loop and that kind of referred to how the phone company set it up. Essentially it uses high frequency data transmission to send data over existing phone lines. So the, the main difference between DSL and cable is DSL uses phone lines as opposed to cable internet or cable television infrastructure. So it kind of means that voice and data can be sent simultaneously because they're sort of on different frequencies. This um, led to, they're sort of on different frequencies. This led to problems with the phone company and the way things work, but that's, well, that's way beyond this class. It's, it's really esoteric and that's more of a, if you're looking into the history of, of telecommunications, that's where that would come up. It's usually lower speed than cable. I say usually because we'll talk about in a minute, there's um, VDSL and uh, it's very high bandwidth DSL or very high bitrate DSL depending, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so cable internet. Cable internet is very similar to DSL, like I mentioned, it, except it uses the infrastructure for cable television. It's, it's the speeds of this can suffer with heavy use because um, it basically relies on a system to, to send out information to everybody that's using it. Whereas with DSL, it's sort of a one-to-one -one connection. It's you connected to the server directly. This, it's sort of you connecting to one machine that sends out information to everybody else that's connected. So if there are a lot of people using it, like, I don't know, uh, Friday night uh, or, you know, Sunday morning or something, a whole bunch of people will be on using it. Um, because of this, most providers will cap your usage. So um, that's where you might hear about download limits and things like that. That's where that comes in. Majority of them cap it pretty high. No, not Most people will never really run into it. You can get around this, but it's pretty much illegal. Um, typically, it is faster than DSL, even with the caps. That's what I have. I'd rather have Fios, and we'll get into why in a minute, um, but it's not available where I live. So Fios and VDSL. VDSL or VHDSL is a faster version of DSL. It offers speeds that are equal to or faster than cable. Basically, 
it uses better hardware, and that's the main difference. The AT&T and Verizon both offer this, um, and Fios is an extremely fast version of DSL. Basically, the difference is in what they call the last mile service. With DSL, traditionally, it used phone lines, standard phone lines, from the phone company to your house. With VDSL and Fios, they run either the Cat5 Ethernet cable or um, fiber optic cable into your house. And so they're able to run a lot more data over that than over a traditional phone line. And so that comes up to last mile service. Um, and that's basically everything that's necessary to go from the service provider to your home. So from, and they, they call it the last mile because everything up till that point runs on, they call it the backbone. It's an extremely high bandwidth um, back end. It has like download speeds and the gigabytes, kind of like we talked about earlier. Some universities are directly connected to that backbone, so they have insanely fast internet transfer. Okay, one last thing. I want to talk about IP addresses now. I've mentioned this a couple times in this video. Uh, it stands for Internet Protocol. So it's an Internet Protocol Address. And uh, you can think of it like a house number. Uh, it's basically a unique address that identifies a computer on the Internet. A uh, typical IP address kind of looks like this. And it's read as 192.168.1.0. This is an example of a reserved IP address. Basically what this means is 192 at the beginning, it's uh, it doesn't go anywhere. Like if you type this on the internet, it doesn't take you any place. Uh, most of you probably have a number like this, like 192.168.1.0 or 172.something or 198.162 is another big one. These addresses are used in what's called an intranet, I-N-T-R-A. It's something internal, like you'd use this in your house. And the idea is that these were reserved, so they're not wild out on the internet. This is a huge, huge area of discussion. Uh, this gets into network routing and sort of how resources are allocated and used on the internet. This could go on for days and days and days and days. Uh, every server and website, like I said, has a unique IP address. So this means that they are running out. Each one of these represents, each of these, they call them octets. Each set represents a collection of eight bytes. Each one of these is referred to as an octet, the 192, etc. And they represent a collection of eight bits. So that brings us to IP version 4 and IP version 6. This is an example of an IP version 4 address. That's what is in use for the most part right now. IP version 6 has been officially adopted. So if we look at this address, 192.168.1.1, that can be represented in binary as this value, 11000000, etc., etc. I'm not going to read that because I'm going to miss zeros. So here you can actually see how the bits are set up. So it's a 32-bit address that's 8, 16, 24, 32. So this means that 255.255.255.255 is the largest IP address in this system. So you, without doing the math, we've already talked about number systems, but you can see there's a very finite range of IP addresses, about 4 billion. It sounds like a lot, but think about all of the devices on the internet, every smartphone, every computer, we're starting to get to a place in time where our refrigerators and our toasters have IP addresses. So they're kind of running out. If I'm not mistaken, I think they've all been assigned. So that's where IP version 6 comes in. It uses 128 bits. So we've talked about that. That's um, We actually haven't talked about how big of a number that is, but it's huge. Um, you remember a 64-bit value could go up to it was 18 quid or no 18 quintillion so a huge number this is a couple orders of magnitude larger so a lot of addresses they believe that the IP version 6 will provide enough addresses for the foreseeable future and I, I fully believe that that's a lot of devices and I think by the time we start getting to that upper limit um, will won't be an issue anymore 
So that's kind of the internet and a very, very brief overview. Um, I may go into more depth in some of these things next week. I uh, maybe not. Um, for now, that's kind of enough information to sort of prepare you for things out in the wild.